God is good and his name is great and we are so humbly proud to be part of his kingdom, aren't we? Well, today we have a wonderful servant of God to minister to us. He comes from Abu Dhabi, the pastor of Word International Ministries Church in Abu Dhabi, a friend and well known to Pastor Sean Rajapaksa, uh, who is in Abu Dhabi as well. And uh, he and his family are here with us, and we warmly welcome every one of them. And we want to open our hearts to hear what God has to say. So let's give a warm welcome, Calvary welcome, to Pastor Fiji John. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. It's a, it's a joy for us to be here as a family. Uh, somehow I'm not used to this way of standing and speaking. <laughs> but it's a joy for us. I, I was just thinking about what the psalmist said when he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. When we left the shores of Abu Dhabi, uh, the only desire we had in our hearts was when we would step into this land, we would be able to worship with the people of this land, the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when I mentioned this to Pastor Sean, he said, well, we should not just be meeting and worshiping together, but we'd like you to share the word as well. So we'd like to thank Pastor Tissa. I had the privilege of meeting him when Calvary International celebrated their 25th anniversary in Abu Dhabi. Uh, had the privilege of being ministered to by him as well. And it's a joy for us to be in this land for the very first time and to be part of you all and worship the Lord together. Amen. The privilege is all ours. And thank you to the Pastor Tissa and for the congregation for giving us this privilege to join you in worship and also to be sharing the word with you this morning. Forgive me if I would say this afternoon because our service is always in the afternoon and you're always used to saying in the afternoon, in the afternoon. So if I, if I say in the afternoon, please pardon me. This afternoon, this morning, <laughs> sometimes you just, pa you just get used to words. Uh, this morning, I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of the prophet Haggai or Haggai, as some of us would like to pronounce it. And I like to read a few verses from the first chapter of the book of Haggai as we just uh, begin to think a little bit about what God had to say to this group of people through his servant, the prophet Haggai. If you're there with me in chapter 1, I'd just like to read from verse 1 down through verse 5. Are you there with me? Okay. Reading from verse 1 unto verse 5. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panel houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Shall we just pray together and ask the Lord that by his spirit he will quicken these words and these words will penetrate our hearts, our thoughts and our minds this morning. Join me as we just pray together. Father of all grace, we come before you. You are our helper, our defender. And above all, you are the God who sees our situations. You hear our groans and cries. You're the same God who said that I will come down and deliver. And Father, you're the same one who speaks to your people every day. And Father, we just come to you this morning as we have gathered here as your people as you have summoned us to meet with you, so that you could speak to us through your word. We pray, Father, that the word that is spoken this morning, Lord, will Lord, truly penetrate our hearts. May it be like the fire that will burn up dross in our lives. May it be like the water that will bring cleansing to our lives and refreshing. And we pray, Father, may it be, Lord, uh, the sword that will pierce our hearts, that, Father, we will be able to respond to it and not just be hearers of it, but Lord, we will receive your word 
and be able to live it out in our lives each day of our lives. Father, I just pray that you'll give me the grace to bring forth your word in the power of your spirit. And for those who would listen, Lord, to be able to receive it, Lord, with humility, that we together, Father, will be able to live Christ in our day-to-day -day lives. We just bless you and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. In the year 536 BC, a group of about 50,000 of people, Jews, returned from Babylon to Judah under the decree of Cyrus, king of Persia. When they returned, they began to quickly rebuild the temple and they began to offer sacrifices. Rather, they built the altar and started to offer sacrifices. The sole purpose and the reason that they decided to go back there was so that they could build the temple of the Lord. Two years after they had returned, they had laid the foundation to rebuild the temple. And the Samaritan neighbors who surrounded them offered to help these folks. But they refused help from them. And so what the Samaritans did was that they really put a roadblock and they sent a lobby, a delegation to Persia to lobby against the building or the rebuilding of the temple. And so the work of the rebuilding of the temple was brought to a halt. Now 14 years had passed since the foundation was laid and the people had begun to get caught up in the whole process of life, everyday life. They were now farming, they were now building houses, they were involved in raising families and that sort of thing. And they began to get used to life without a temple. Interestingly, their leaders, Zerubbabel, who was the governor, the national leader and the, or the politician, and then you had Jehozadak, the high priest, who was a spiritual leader. Both of these people actually got used to be living without the temple. Now, it is into this scene that the, God raises the prophet Haggai to speak to this group of returned remnant who had come back with the sole purpose of rebuilding the temple and establishing the worship of God in Jerusalem. The book of Haggai actually consists of four messages, just four precisely dated messages. The first one is found in the book of Haggai, chapter 1, and it was given on August 29th, 520 BC. That's a long, long time ago. Amen? And we might wonder, what's the purpose of this message? If I were to sum up what this message is all about in one line, it would be this. Give God the supreme place in your life. The whole summary of this message is about giving God the priority number one or giving him the supreme place in our lives. Well, it's a very funny thing to say to Christians. Give God the supreme place in your lives. Amen? Pastor Sean told me that you're a very responsive audience. So you can always uh, say an amen or a hallelujah once in a while, right? It's surprising, right? When you tell a Christian, you must put God first, you might think, what is this guy trying to tell me? Put God first. But you must understand that this message was given to people like you and me who already know that they needed to give God the supreme place in their lives. It was given to people who knew that they needed to put God first. It was given to people who actually knew that trusting in the riches of this world meant nothing. It was given to a group of people who knew that, well, living in this life and living the way they wanted to live it was in vain. It was to these people that God was trying to speak to them and remind them that they needed to put God first or give him the supreme place in their lives. It was given to a group of, perhaps if I would ask you, do you know that there is no happiness without Jesus Christ? What would you say? We know, right? If I were to ask you, well, what is the whole purpose of your lives? Where, where can you find meaning in your lives? It's in Christ. And you will say, yes, we know that. The point is we all know these things. But there's a problem with that. We have a knowledge which is intellectual. And these people had an intellectual understanding that they needed to put God first in their lives, but their real life had a disconnect and there was no connect between what they believed and the note they knew and the way they lived. They gave lip service to God by telling him that, well, you are first in our lives, but when they looked at their lives, their lives absolutely shared a different story. And that's where the problem lies. 
I believe all of you sitting in this place are sitting here because you love the Lord. I believe every one of you here is here because you know that well, without Jesus, life has no meaning. You know that, and I know it. But the point here is, the question here that the prophet is trying to raise is, do our lives reflect what we know and understand intellectually? Is there a disconnect between what we know and understand and the way we live? Do we give lip service to God and say, well, God ought to be the very first in, our, in my life. But the reality of our lives speaks differently. And that's the challenge. And the message here is very simple. It says, we are all prone to put our priorities above God and God's house. We are all prone to put our plans, our purposes, our objectives about that of God. And yet we would say, yes, we believe that God is to be given the supreme place in our lives. This is what I normally call the default, the default mode in our fallen computers. I believe if all of us use computers these days, and you know, we also have people, some of who are older generation, we use computers and I like, and we open these computers, and then you know, I have a mother, she is very, very, uh, she loves computers, right? She loves to work on computers. She's more, uh, she's more used to all the latest uh, technologies available and she types in things and finally she gets stuck. You know, probably using computers and we don't know much about it. We try and fiddle with it and somehow something goes wrong and then we don't know what to do with it. And then the, the manufacturers of these computers actually have put something there. They call it the default mode. When you don't know what to do and you're stuck, the one thing you can do is go and say, restore factory settings or restore the default mode. And the moment you hit that button, everything would be as before. In our, we also as human beings have a default mode. And the default mode in our fallen computers is not to do the will of God. It's not prone to be doing what God has for our lives. By default, we always want to do our own thing. We want to give, make our priorities about the priorities that God has for our lives. We put our plans and our objectives about what God has for our lives. That's our default mode. No wonder the Bible says that each of us have gone our own separate ways. Each one of us will do what we want to do. Because that's our default fallen mode. Even in Christ, that is our mode. It's only that Christ redeems that. And we need to understand that if we do not fight this, if we do not stand up against this, we will drift and we will end up doing what we need for our lives and not giving God the first and the supreme place in our lives. The book of Haggai is the second shortest book in the Old Testament. You can read it in a matter of 10, 15 minutes. But it has a very powerful message to all of us who live in this generation today. Right? And I like to just make four observations that you can find in this particular portion that we read. And I just like to close with two thoughts and two suggestions that we would love to apply in our lives. So the first one is this. Those people who put themselves and their priorities about God's house are often committed believers. Those people who put their priorities about that of God and his house are often committed believers. If you need to understand this prophecy in its context and what this message meant to those people, you need to understand that this message was spoken to a group of people who left an established life in Babylon and traveled and made the commitment to leave all that behind and come back because they believed in the promise that God had for their lives. So we are not talking about a group of people here who don't know what it means to be committed. They know that very well because these people had established lives in Babylon. They had businesses, they had good jobs, they were, having, they were raising a family there, everything was safe and secure, they were living very well. Until such time that they began to understand that our promise, the promise God has given us, involves the land of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. So these people took a very step, a bold step of faith 
and they decided to leave their secure lives in Babylon and travel along this dangerous, perilous way and go to this land of Judah, which was devastated by war and in ruins. It's like me telling you today, or if God is telling you, leave this land of Sri Lanka and go to Gaza. It's like telling you, leave this land and I want you to go to Syria because my promise and purpose for your lives is in that land. How many of you would be willing to leave this land and go? Amen? I didn't see any hands. <laughs> and we talk about commitment. These people had made a very, very strong commitment. They, they had let they had put on the line their lives, their jobs, their security, everything, only to go to that land which is devastated, not knowing what would happen of them. So we are not talking about people who are not committed. We are talking to people who were committed believers. And I know you sitting here are also committed believers, but because once upon a time you gave your lives to Christ. Amen? You had this wonderful zeal for Jesus Christ. Reading the Bible was, a, was an enjoyable affair. You enjoyed it. You enjoyed being part of fellowship. You enjoyed coming together. But a little bit of time has gone by and things have begun to change. Right? Perhaps you were trying to do something and your efforts met with difficulties. Things began to change. You had probably a personality clash with someone else in, in, in the family of God. You were either disillusioned with what was happening. You were disillusioned with the disappointment and the results. You probably encountered personal trials along the way which did not even go away with much prayer. Many times we think we pray and we pray and we pray and nothing seems to happen and we begin to think, well, is God really alive? And as a result, what happens is life moves on. That's exactly what happened to these people. Life moved on. They began to raise a family and start, some started a family. Perhaps you begin to start a family and then you realized you had bills to pay, right? And then there became a cycle. Well, then you begin to think, well, I will just let the Lord's work and his house take a back seat so I can actually deal with these issues. Church and the Lord's work drifted into the background. And what happened is, you still probably continue to attend church. You're part of some Bible study. But what has happened really is that these things have become only a slice of your life, not the center of it anymore. Amen? That's the point the prophet and God is trying to make to his people. Is he at the center of our lives? Is he the center or is he just a slice of the center? And that's the question that's being raised. Perhaps you tell yourself now, well, I don't have time as I used to have to serve. Well, someone who does not have, does not have too many responsibilities now can serve. The point here is, without deliberately rebelling against God, we have drifted away into a life of rebelling against God. We are not, we will never say we rebel against God, but the way we live our lives now is a way of drifting away and in doing so, we have put our priorities above that of God's. We have put our life above God's house. And that's what the prophet really tries to remind us. So if you're sitting here, I'd like you to understand that this message is not given to a group of people who did not know what commitment was. They had paid the price for commitment. But like I said, the default mode in our fallen computers is about drifting away from the center who is God himself. Even committed people can drift. And perhaps as you listen to me, perhaps you're beginning to think and God is trying to even put this word across to you that have you drifted away from making me the center of your lives. He's not questioning your commitment. But he's asking you. Have you made me a slice only of your lives? The second observation is this. That those who put themselves and their priorities about God's house. Have reasons. Or I would say excuses. For their lifestyles. Those people, perhaps you're thinking, oh wow, this message is coming and God has been speaking to you and your conscience begins to nag you. So immediately you have some kind of a reason or an excuse to justify your actions and your behavior. The second observation is those who put themselves and their priorities about God's house are people who are making excuses or reasons for their 
lifestyle. Let me read for you chapter 1 verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be rebuilt. The time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be rebuilt. After the foundation was laid, 14 years have passed. And they say that the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be rebuilt. The reason they came back to settle in the land of Judah was because they really wanted to see the Lord's house being rebuilt. That was a primary purpose. But yet they say now, and this is God speaking to them and saying, you guys are saying that the time has not yet come that the Lord's house has to be rebuilt. Perhaps it's, it's like, if you look at it this way, if you had the opportunity to be with these people and you would want to ask them, well, what is the reason uh, why the temple had not been rebuilt or is not being built? They definitely would have a number of responses. One of them would say, well, don't get us wrong. We are all for the building of the temple. We believe it's a noble cause. We believe it's a great cause. But the time really has not come. You see, we are in an economic downturn. There's recession now in our land. Right? We're trying to establish lives. How on earth do you expect us to actually get involved with the work of rebuilding? We have bills to pay. We have our children who, whom we need to put through school. We have our children probably who are going to, uh, to college now. We need to really work through these things. It's not yet time. The time will come and we will rebuild it. Perhaps then there are those, uh, some kind of a super spiritual people who have this habit of justifying everything, not by natural logical reasons, but more by scripture. Perhaps some of them would have said, well, you know, the Bible says that we must take care of our household. If we did not provide for our household, we are worse than unbelievers. So we got to wait because, see, you see, we are having a tough time with our kids. They're small toddlers now. We have to give them our time, our efforts, our energies. Great. God understands that. We have a number of other things that we're pursuing. When that's done, when we have finished dealing with our household and doing the things that God says we need to do, we will get down to the work of rebuilding. Perhaps for some of you, it might be a very hectic time in your family life. Your kids demand so much attention. But someday we'll be through this phase and we will be able to put God first and get on building his house. God is actually asking his people this question. When would be the time that you can really get down to rebuilding? When is that perfect time? Let me say this, brothers and sisters, there is no perfect phase or time in life that you can get down to prioritizing and putting God first in our lives. If you're a child, you need to do it while you're a child. If you say, well, I'll get a little older and then I'll do it, it's not going to happen. If you're a young person, if you do not learn to put God first and to that phase of your life, you will get married and never be able to do that in your life. Very, very seldom. If you're married and you think, well, let me finish my marital responsibilities, let me get settled in life, when I retire, I will think about God and his work, then you will never get there. I know many people back in our city, I don't know how it's in Sri Lanka, but in Abu Dhabi, everyone plans that when says, well, many of them say, when we turn, when we are 58 and we retire or 60, we will really want to do something for the Lord's house. But the point is, that's not what God is wanting. And people have excuses and reasons to give for their lifestyles. The question is, God is saying, will you put me first in the very face of your life? Would you want to do away with all the reasons and the excuses you put before God and before people for not making God the very center of your lives? The third observation is this. Those who put themselves and their priorities about God's house are blind to God's chastising hand. This is really exciting or interesting. The people in Haggai's days were having problems. Let me read for you from verse 6. Look what they say. God is speaking this. You have planted much, but have harvested little. 
You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. The people who had returned were having problems. They had sowed a lot of seed, but they harvested very little. And you understand that when you have little sow, seed to sow in the current year, and you're trying to make up for the past bad year, you're going deeper and deeper into trouble and into debt. No matter how hard they tried, they just found that their work and effort was in vain. Inflation had gone up. By the way, inflation is not a 21st century term. Inflation had gone up and gobbled the very little that they were even having. And here you see, by the end of the month, there was really nothing left. And that's why a very, very powerful phrase where God says, it's like you put your money into a bag with holes. We use it in English, but don't understand where it really comes from. It's God saying that you've been doing a lot and doing much, and perhaps you don't know what's happening to it. And the reality is, the bad times meant, the little that they had meant that the Lord's house would not be rebuilt anytime soon. How could they, who were trying to sustain themselves, build the Lord's house? And then you begin to think, does God really see their situation? Does God really know their situation? We know a God, like was said a while ago, we know a God who sees our situations, who hears our groans, who is willing to come down and deliver. Didn't this God understand their situation? Why was he telling them that they, want, they needed to get involved in building the house of God first? Didn't he see what they were going through? Yes, God was seeing what they were going through. But what the people did not see was that God was responsible for their situation. Amen? The people saw and the people understood, yes, and God was seeing what they were going through. But what the people did not understand, that those circumstances that they were going through was caused by the hand of God himself. They were blind to the chastising hand of God. They were working harder but going, falling behind faster. But surely they did not understand that it was God and God's hand that was trying to come upon their lives. And look what Haggai does. He says, he comes along and says, Folks, I want you to know that it is God who controls the rain and everything else. I want you to know that he is withholding your blessing because your priorities are not right. You are working against God. Perhaps one of the most loved verses in scripture is found in Romans chapter 8. It says, if God be for us, if God be for us, who can be against us? Isn't it a wonderful promise, a wonderful verse? If God be for us, who can be? So if God is on your side, no one else can stand against you. But I sometimes have this funny way of looking at my Bible. I began to think about it the other way around. If God be against us, who can be for us? Hallelujah. If God is against you, who can be for us? No one. So we need to make sure that in life, God is not on our opposite team. Because if he's on the opposition, then we are in serious trouble. Just as we are in, in a great situation when God is on our side. If God is working against our lives, then we are in trouble. God does not work against us so that he puts us into trouble. God works against our lives so that he can get us to stand up and take notice that he is trying to say something to our lives. And that's exactly what he was doing to his people. He loved them and he said, well, you guys don't seem to be taking notice. I've been trying to speak to you, but you seem to turn a deaf ear. I've been trying to tell you, you need to consider your ways, but you seem to turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to everything that I'm trying to show you. So he says, the only way I can actually get your attention is work against you. 
so that you will stand up and take notice. Watchman Nee, the Chinese apostle, once said that God restrains or holds back the blessings of people, or in, in, in specifically in terms of finances, so that he will be able to control and restrain his overzealous servants. God has a way of working with people. And this is exactly what he was trying to do. He was trying to get their attention and say, well, you don't realize that I, I am on the opposite team. I am working against your life just for the fact that you will begin to stand up and take notice and know that I have something to say to you. And, as, and the story goes on and says, they needed to stop and consider that they were working against God. They needed to take a pause. And that's the thought that I would like to leave before you, is that are you working against God? You can be a committed Christian but your intellectual understanding can really not go in line with your life. Are you working against God? If so, you need to heed. God is doing some things. Perhaps your life situations are simply a wake-up call from God to help you look at your mixed-up priorities in life. And the final observation is this, that those people who put their prosperity about God's house never get what they are after. They never get what they are after. Let me read for you verse 6 again. You have planted much but have harvested little. You eat but have never enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. In fact, if you read this whole, whole chapter, you'll understand that these people had a measure of success. Because in one verse, chapter, one verse 2 it says they were living in fine paneled houses. In, in fact, they had what you call success as the world will talk about it. But that's not the point. The point that God is trying to make that though they had food to eat, they were never filled. It never satisfied them. They had things to drink. Their thirst was never satisfied. They, they had clothes to wear. They, they were never kept fully warm. The point that God is trying to make is when you put and I put God's priorities, our priorities about God's, we can have a number of things, but they will never give us satisfaction and complete joy. Hallelujah. So perhaps we will live half-baked lives. Well, we have all of these things. I've heard so many Christians say this. Well, we have all these things, but we don't seem to enjoy life. We're not satisfied with life. Something is amiss. Something is wrong somewhere. Solomon echoed these words very well. He tried money, fame, knowledge, sensual pleasure, and everything a man could dream of. And at the end of it, he said, vanity of vanities. Everything is meaningless. What was he trying to say? Nothing in this world can satisfy us except God himself. Everything in the world is meaningless without God at the center of it. When God is at the center of our lives, our money will be able to satisfy us and bring us joy. When God is at the center of our lives, we will find that even fame and all the pleasures of life will begin to make great sense to our lives. But without God at the center, nothing will make this sense at all. So at the end of the day, when they heard the message, the point is, what did the people do when they heard the message? That's the point. That's the million dollar question. We can have sermons after sermons that we would hear. Messages after messages we would hear. But what God is interested in, what was the response to his message? And the response was simple. The people in that time decided to put God and his house above their priorities and their prosperities. In other words, their response was saying, God, we have understood. We know what has gone wrong. So we now need to set that right. And they decided to do something. They decided to begin the rebuilding of the temple. And as we listen to this message, there is only one response that we can come up with. There's only one and only one response. And that response is, we need to put God first. We need to put God's house first. You could hear a lot of things, but the point is, God is interested to know how you and I would respond. And our response can only be one. We need to bring back God 
to the very center of our lives. Not by giving lip service, but by actually making that the reality of our lives. We need to put God's house first. And that's what is expected of us. But as we've used this word, God's house, a number of times in, my, in the message that you heard. So it's important that I would clarify or bring to, bring to your understanding what it really means to put God's house first. In the text that we are actually referring to, God's house refers to the temple in Jerusalem. The physical temple in Jerusalem. The temple was a center for the worship of God. Although God does not dwell or God dwells everywhere... God actually made his presence felt in a very special way to the people at the temple in Jerusalem. That's, what, that's why it's called his dwelling place. He, made, he met with his people there. He made his presence manifest in that place. So to allow the temple to be lying in ruins, tantamounted to actually neglecting the worship of God. So when these people allowed the temple to lie in ruins, the message that comes across was they were not interested in the worship of God or meeting with God and hearing from God. The writer James Boyce puts it this way. In the final analysis, all inverted priorities are idolatry. Every inverted priority, according to James Boyce, is idolatry. In other words, we might not have idols in this facility. We might say we are not idol worshippers, but every time we have inverted priorities, we are idol worshippers and idolaters. We have put creation before the, crea the, the creator. So the problem when we talk about putting God's house first simply means is to put our priorities in order. When God is telling his people, he's saying, put your priorities in order. Put your house in order. Make sure that I, I am at the center of your very lives. And let that be seen in the way you live. And the question that I'd like to conclude with is this. How do, I, how do we do that? How do we put God first in our lives? How do you make his house the priority? How do we get our inverted priorities in order? Let me leave you with two thoughts. Number one, to put God first requires deliberate and continual effort. Let me say that again. If you and I want to put God first in our lives and get our priorities in order, it requires deliberate effort and it requires continual or continued effort. As I said a while ago, our default mode is to go the other way. So if we let ourselves, we will drift in this direction, not in the direction towards God. If we are not intentional and deliberate, the, the, real, the story is that we will move away from God and be living like these people until God gives us a wake-up call. And what do you see here? This it was so intentional, it started with two people. Zerubbabel the governor and Jehozadak the high priest. Two of these people. The political leaders and the spiritual leaders of the nation. They, it required humility on the part of these two people to start this move. That's why leaders are very important. It should start with them that they will begin to get priorities in order. And it takes a lot of humility on their part. They could have easily said, who is this Haggai? We don't even know this guy. This upstart prophet from somewhere. What is he saying? Thus says the Lord. They could have said, who are you Haggai? But you do not see that. We see that both these people humbled themselves and they received the word of God the way it came to them. And they decided to say, we got our priorities wrong. We're going to set it right. And we are going to be the ones to lead by example. And they listened and they obeyed. The application is very simple. When the Bible, which is God's authoritative word of the Lord, speaks to our lives, we have only two responses that we can give it. When the Bible and the truth of God's word confronts us the way we live, we can either resist it by making excuses, we can either resist it by making a lot of reasons and excuses, or we can simply obey it. But one-time obedience is not enough. Our obedience needs to be continual. So if we are serious about getting our priorities in order and keeping it in place, then we need to begin to be intentional and deliberate in the way we will work our lives. It needs not a one-time affair that we will once come and be so emotionally moved in the service that we decide, well, I want to make God my first priority. 
may get my priorities in order. You leave this hall, you leave this room, and the moment you go home, everything is forgotten, and you get back to your lives. It won't do. This is not about some emotional joyride. It's about intentional, deliberate work, day in and day out, to allow God to get you into, your, into shape with your priorities, and to keep it in place. It's not going to happen by simply some emotional high that we are on. The Spirit of God has been given to us so that God by His indwelling Spirit can help us keep our inverted priorities in order. Put Him first, keep Him at the center and not make Him a slice of our lives. The second thought is this. To put God first requires constant self-evaluation in the fear of God. It requires constant self-evaluation in the fear of God. Two times... The prophet tells the people, or God speaks and says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways in verses 5 and 7. And it's important that we actually begin to evaluate our lives. Many a times we hear wonderful, powerful messages that God gives us people. But well, once we are out to out the door and we are gone, we forget about it. And we seldom really sit down to evaluate our lives in the light of the word that we have heard. So let me give you some, a few thoughts here in close. Right? Number one, the first thing you need to ask yourself. Ask yourself these serious questions. What do you think about the most? What is it that occupies your mind? What is it that consumes your mind? What secretly occupies your thought life? Do you dream of getting rich, achieving fame, or doing some hobby, or, or actually pursuing some leisure activities? Or do you think about the Lord? How, what do you think? What occupies your mind? It's very important because that's how you will end up becoming. So we need to ask ourselves this question. If we want to get our priorities right, how, what do I think about? What takes up my life? What is at the very core of my thought life? The other question you need to ask yourself is, how are you spending your money? Actually, it is not your money and not my money. It's God's. What are you doing with it? The folks claim, these people claim that they could not get their own houses built first. How could they build God's house? The point is, what is it we're doing with the resources that God has given us? It's not ours, it's God's. The people here got it backwards. And God says, that's why I withheld blessing from them. We need to ask ourselves, what am I doing with what God has given me? Who, another question, who are my friends? Whom do I associate with? Whom do I tag along with? Who are these people who fill up my lives? Whom do I like to spend time with? Because if you want to spend time with all the Rotarians in your, in your club, or you're part of the Rotary Club, no, uh, nothing wrong with it, but if all your time is spent with them, I don't think you are much, of much use to God. Seriously. I don't know if there are any Rotarians here. Huh. Amen. I want us to think. There are innumerable questions that we need to ask ourselves so that we can begin to evaluate our lives. It's not about hearing a number of messages. I've come to realize this after a number of years in walking with Christ, that it's not about hearing too many things, but what you do with what you hear. So if you're hearing today and say, God, I want to get my priorities in order, then you've got to sit down, take a piece of pen and paper, and begin to ask yourself some serious questions. I've just given you a few of them so that you can begin to think and take a deep look into your lives. And as you continue to do it, deliberately, intentionally, in obedience and the fear of God, you will see the true blessing of God that comes when we begin to make him the center of our lives. What happens when we put God first? This is how the, how the message closes. When we put God's house first, above our priorities and above ourselves, God is pleased. God is glorified. His work gets done and He truly blesses us. In verse 8 it says, when we put God's house first, He is pleased and glorified. God is looking for glory and pleasure from his people. Nothing more, nothing less. We have been created to simply glorify God. 
Isaiah says that God has called a people for himself, for his glory, not for anything else. For his pleasure and for his glory. When we get our priorities light and we step off the throne and we allow God to be the center of our lives, God is glorified. We can sing a lot of glory songs, but God is not glorified by just us singing. But God is truly glorified when we get our lives in order. The other thing says, when we put God's house first, his work gets done. Whose temple was that? It was the dwelling place of the Almighty One. His work. When the people began to bring him to the center of their lives, his work and the building of the temple started again. God stirred up the heart of the leaders. He stirred up the heart of the people. So if you are trying to do a lot of things and are frustrated at the end of the day, the reason is you need to come back and evaluate and say, is God at the very center of my life? Or am I doing all these things just to please me, to give me a little ego trip, to make, to glorify myself or to project myself or to make myself recognizable? You will only end up being frustrated even if it is a service of God because it's God's work and his work will be done in his way and in his time and in the way he knows best. That's what Hudson Taylor said. When we put God's house first, he truly blesses us. In verse 13 it says, When the people obeyed, God sent the word, I am with you. And like I said a while ago, if God is with us, we have everything. Perhaps if God is seemingly distant in your life, perhaps your priorities have gotten mixed up. God is not saying that you're not committed. You don't love him, but perhaps you have mixed up your priorities. And that's why you don't seem to be satisfied. When we begin to put him first, we will experience a new awareness of his presence. That is true blessing. When God says, and you know, he is with me. Every time when God had to affirm and encourage someone in the scriptures, you will find this thing, I am with you. Jesus said, I am with you in the Old Testament. That is true blessing. If he is with us, then everything makes sense. If he's not with us, nothing will make sense. So as we draw to a close, I'd like to invite you probably to stand or sit. I don't know how we do it. But to simply begin to do an evaluation of your lives and begin to think, I will ask Pastor Tisa to come forward and he will lead us from here. What an incredible word from God. You know, it's one of the best messages I've ever heard in recent times. The Lord has given a prophetic word to our church. We've got to be very sensitive to how the Holy Spirit wants us to respond to His word. Let's rise to our feet. I don't think it can be any clearer than we heard this morning. Don't you think so? It can't be any clearer. And the choice and the steps we, sh we should take can't be any clearer than was told this morning. God bless you. You know what? It's very easy to get priorities mixed up. I don't want to live in the default mode, do you? I want to make sure my life is ordered according to his plan. God is not just a slice, but he's a center. I was reading this morning to and even last night, where Joshua called the people to continuous renewal of the covenant. Like Pastor Fiji John said, it's not a matter of making a decision once and then 
relaxing, but it is continuous renewal of the covenant. I want to be sure I get my priorities right. You know that pastors and preachers get their priorities wrong, so it's no, no surprise that people get their lives, you know, fouled up. Let's come here, all of you, all of us who want to God to reorder our priority, just come here and let the Lord. When you come here, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Sometimes people worship their families. Some preachers worship their own ministries. They don't worship God. It's so easy to go off course and be in that default mode. We want God to work. You know what the Holy Spirit wants you to do? He wants you to identify your idolatry and mine. What is it that's keeping me from prioritizing God, his kingdom, his church, his work in my life? Are you humble enough to be open about it? All right? And let God work. Right now, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. You just be silent for a moment in the presence of the Lord. So what the Lord wants you to do, just identify your idols. Committed believer, identify your idols. Your idol. It could be your family. I don't want to repeat the message. It's done very well. No addition is necessary. But identify. Let the Holy Spirit show you. You know what they are? All right. Can you find somebody close to you and tell them if you can and get them to pray for you right now? All right, do that right now. Find somebody of your own sex. Tell them this is what I think is my idol. Will you pray for me and you pray for each other right now? Okay, do that. Do that. Okay, pray for somebody else. All right, turn around, introduce yourself. All right. Do that right now and let the Lord work and wash. Do it. Otherwise, the message will mean nothing unless it works in your heart right now and goes deep into your soul and to the inner recesses of your being. Do it right now. This is the moment. This is the moment for you. This is a golden moment. A golden moment. A golden moment for you. Let the Lord work right now. Hallelujah. Talk. Pray for each other right now. And let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Banish that idol in Jesus' name. Banish that idol in Jesus' name. Go through the trauma of repentance. Cast it out of your life. Turn away from it. Say, Lord, 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 I cry out to you. I cry out to you. I cry out to you, Lord. I cry out to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I cry out to you, Lord. Oh, I hate that default mode. I hate it with a passion. I hate that default mode. I hate it with a passion. I want God. I want God as all, center and all, in my life, my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now let the Spirit move. Let the Spirit move mightily. Hallelujah. Let the Spirit move in mighty power, delivering you, setting you free. Idols falling off. Hallelujah. Idols falling off. Deliverance has come. Hallelujah. Deliverance has come. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Renew the covenant before the Lord right now. Renew the covenant. Lord, I renew. I renew. I renew. I want the passion I had before. The fire to burn in my soul. 
I want Jesus in the center of my life. Oh Lord, Hallelujah. Oh Lord, Hallelujah. Pour out your spirit. Anoint me by your power. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, let me dream your dreams, not my dreams. Your dreams, Lord. Your thoughts, your friends, and your decisions. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.